All right, so I'm going to be presenting to you some of the uh, neurobiological evidence showing that adolescents are from a distinct class. But remember, thinking of adolescent as a group of individuals, not as an individual in itself. And I'd like to start with this, um, with this slide to present a couple of things to you, that adolescence is extremely unique because it's essentially different from the beginning period of infancy and childhood where abilities are accumulating, where the brain is going through substantial transformations. Adolescence, actually, you already have all the basic abilities there, and the gross morphology of the brain is already available. And what we're talking about is an elbow in the trajectory demarcated by puberty when you're entering that period of stability that is adulthood before we start to fall off at the end. <laughs> so just to point out, it's unique and it is transitory. Um, adolescence, of course, as you have heard, is unusual also because it is a time when there is a peak in sensation seeking. Now, this is of interest because um, this is evident across societies and across species. This is seen in the rodent model. This is seen in the non-human primate model. So monkeys and mice and rats also show that during puberty, there's an increase in sensation seeking. And what sensation seeking is really speaking to is exploratory behavior in novelty seeking. And I will talk to you a little bit more about this as we go through in the respect that it does have an adaptive goal to it. So first, let me tell you a little bit about what is occurring with respect to changes in the brain. I know this is a busy slide, but I'll go uh, through it a little bit by little bit. So um, here I'm showing you uh, brains for children, adolescents, and adults. This is from a colleague of mine at the NIMH, Jay Geed. And what he did here was he measured the thickness of the gray matter. You heard about the gray matter earlier today, where the neurons actually live. And blue means that um, the stable adult level cortical thickness has been reached. And what I want to show you here that in the adolescent period, there are still areas that have not reached adult levels of thinning. And this includes prefrontal cortex, but also a range of other regions throughout the neocortex that um, are responsible for language, for executive control, for attention. So it's, it's more collectively than just prefrontal executive um, function. Also, cortical thinning in the basal ganglia is still not at adult levels in adolescence. And that's a very important point. You heard about dopamine. Dopamine is the neurochemical in the brain that underlies this uh, feeling of motivation, of pleasure when you take drugs and so forth. It's also a, the critical neurochemical for learning. So this is also an important thing to keep in mind. Now, what is thought to underlie these changes in the gray matter is the pruning of synapses. That means that a wonderful thing about the brain is that it allows itself to be sculpted by its environment. And this is done by the loss of unnecessary synapses and the strengthening of the connections that we actually need. Uh, on the other side, you heard about the white matter, the axonal connections that allow the brain to integrate the function of different regions so it can be a very, you know, um, great working oiled machine. And what I'm showing you here is what occurs at the level of the white matter. So what occurs is that you get a process called myelination. You have these axons, they're wrapped with fatty tissues that dramatically increase the speed of the neuronal transmission. So effectively what happens is if you think of prefrontal cortex as providing control, as you get myelinated, the prefrontal cortex can more quickly go down to those reflexive subcortical limbic regions and say, no, don't do that. We're going to follow my plan. So it becomes very relevant to development. Now I'm, sure, I'm showing you a couple of the results that um, my lab has found, but also other laboratories have also found, which th th that is that there is a hierarchical 
development of white matter. And what you see is that sensory and motor regions are myelinating first. Subsequently, regions uh, um, connectivity that support cognitive control has a great period of growth from childhood to adolescence, but is available by adolescence. What continues to develop, and this is represented here, this is age, these are all the different uh, white matter regions in the brain, um, and that the last areas to start to develop, one is the cingulum, which provides connections between the anterior cingulate, a part of the brain that has to do with control, and the limbic system. And the last connections to develop are the ones that provide connectivity between the orbital frontal cortex, the amygdala, which you've heard about that has to do with emotion, and temporal regions. So the social emotional system of the brain is the last to mature, and it's going through active plasticity all throughout adolescence, including early young adulthood. And finally, of great relevance, is that the, do the neurotransmitter dopamine um, is peaking in its availability during the adolescent period. So in other words, we have a brain that is very much um, driven towards sensation seeking because you have a lot of dopamine that is already there. And, and this will make a little bit more sense as we get into brain function. Now with brain function, I'm going to try to hit on three major things. Cognitive development, reward motivation, and social emotional development. So first with cognitive development, I want to bring to your attention two important aspects of control. One is cognitive control, when you're able to filter out distractors so that you can follow an actual plan, and working memory, which is the process that allows you to maintain a plan that can guide your subsequent behavior. Both of these continue to mature throughout adolescence. I'm showing you here a couple of results from two different studies showing that although adolescents are a lot better than children, and also shown here, they are still not at adult levels. So this is a recurrent theme, a lot better than children approximating adult levels. Now when we look at brain function, we start to see something um, very specific as to how the team brain is different. So here's one study where, you know, and we can talk a little bit more about the type of tasks that are used to probe the integrity of executive control systems. But overall, what has been found are, number one, that networks of regions that allow the adolescent brain to maintain a controlled state is still not there. They can engage it, but it's not as robust as the adult um, uh, system. Longitudinal data from our laboratory, and this is under review right now, and here we have age and the percent fMRI signal change. And what we have found is that from childhood to adolescence, there is a decrease, less prefrontal cortex is needed. By adolescence, adult levels are reached. And you need less prefrontal cortex because it becomes easier for you to engage cognitive control. The one thing that is dramatically changing through age is the use of the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. This is a part of the brain that monitors what we do. And whenever we, we commit an error, it lights up and says, okay, you've committed an error. This should inform subsequent behavior. That is still not there in adolescence, and that continues to improve into the 20s. And in fact, um, it has a very significant relationship to behavior. And um, uh, talking about something that Buffy brought up, the way that I look at it is that neuroimaging is only valid when it really speaks to behavior. So we can't live without the behavioral psychologist. <laughs> Um, another aspect of cognition, and um, I, I, I don't want to uh, spend too much time because I realize I'm probably talking too much, but there are networks that are formed in the brain. 
It's more about networks than about regional. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex doesn't do much. I remember explaining to a student, prefrontal cortex is like me in the lab. I tell everybody what to do. I really don't know how to do anything anymore, but I know who does everything. So I orchestrate how everything is occurring. So connectivity becomes extremely important. And to sum up what some of these studies have found, and they're great studies, and um, they're from my laboratory. <laughs> uh, but one incredibly recurrent theme is that the connections from prefrontal to downward regions, the ones that provide control, are already available by adolescence. And then there's subsequent refinement, but it's already there. And I think, as you'll see, this will make a lot of sense. So when we think about reward motivation, so you um, do cognitive control studies or just any study whatsoever with um, adolescents. You offer them some money and critical parts of the brain light up like crazy, more so than adults. And I'm showing you several different um, laboratories. This is BJ Casey's laboratory, um, uh, Evelyn Cronin. And I know that the names don't correspond because those are the students who had them. Uh, even my laboratory as well. We find, and I, I know that you can't see this very well, but the point is that the ventral striatum, which is the dopamine-rich area of the brain, shows overreactivity in the adolescent brain compared to adults, really showing us that there is front that adolescents um, have a different reaction to uh, reward. And in the meantime, the executive part of the reward system, the orbital frontal cortex, shows decreased function. Now, this is the part of the brain that will help you assess the importance of a reward cue. More importantly, um, and here, uh, here's behavioral changes. Um, th this is what I've shown you before, that adolescents have a very hard time um, uh, showing the control of their behavior. If you offer them money, all of a sudden they can do it perfectly well. <laughs> so how can that be fun? How can that be occurring? Well, what we have found, and this is age, and this is the signal response through time. This is what we call the bold response, which you heard about earlier today. And the point here is the following: <coughs> that the way that they can improve their performance is by increasing this ventral striatum, the dopamine pumping out. And that, in parallel, increasing the parts of the brain that allow you to make that response. So in a sense, it's, set, it's setting yourself up to be a very impulsive system. Once you show reward, it goes full throttle so it can obtain that reward. And that is essentially different from what the adult brain does. Now, social-emotional processing, there were several different studies these are from a range of, uh, of laboratories, uh, but mainly from uh, Sarah Jane Blakemore uh, over in London. And the type of things that she has found when she shows emotional stimuli, but more so when she assesses the ability for an adolescent to be able to, um, to process the intentions of others and the emotions of others, there are very dramatic limitations in the brain reactivity of the adolescent. And um, finally, the importance of peer influence. This is a study from Larry Steinberg's um, uh, laboratory, which has caused a lot, a lot of interest in the field, because here they were finding how the presence of a peer during the adolescent period does something different to the adolescent brain than it does to the, ad to the adult brain. Uh, this was a driving task, and adole uh, adolescents drove just as well as adults when they were doing this without peers. When you brought a peer in, the number of crashes increased. But that's not the end of the story. The beauty of this study is that they looked at brain function, and what they found was the presence of teens increased activity in this reward-related brain region that I've been talking about, and that actually disrupted their ability um, to, to engage in decision making. So in summary, and I brought this up because this was mentioned earlier, <laughs> uh, and I was like, I have that 
I have that cartoon in my thing, so there you go. <laughs> um, and so in summary, fMRI studies do seem to provide some actual telling qualitative evidence of differences in the adolescent brain. That adolescents have access, that they actually do have access to uh, adult level prefrontal executive control, and that the brain system show overreactivity to rewards in social emotional cues. And what the proposal is that I've been making, and I think other people might also agree, is that something very curious is occurring. All of a sudden, you have an organism that can have access to decision making. However, the decision making is being driven by motivational cues, right? So, which is different from an adult whose motivation, you know, who reward reactivity has started to decrease. So they, and different from children who don't really have that access to the decision making. And one uh, example that I give is a child might look at a roof and think, hmm, it'd be really cool to skateboard down that roof. But they're not going to do it. They're holding their mom's hand. Uh, a teenager might say the same thing and go, yeah, and I can call my buddies and we'll get a ladder and we'll totally do it. And, and I think that that is <laughs> often what we actually see. Uh, so some of the things that um, we have thought about, how could this have implications to the law? So at one level, knowing that there are qualitative differences to the adolescent brain might inform culpability. Not in the sense of guilt. You already know the crime has occurred. But more as circumstantial evidence, indicating the, the adolescent neurobehavior immaturities make them vulnerable to poor decision making in the presence of competing motivational cues. I think where there can really be an impact is in the extent of sentencing. So that when you know that the adolescent stage is transitional, then a long sentence, like the life without parole, does not make as much sense. Um, also, the fact that there's greater amenability for rehabilitation. When I showed you that there's dramatic periods of growth, that is plasticity. That means that that brain is better able to be shaped. Um, so but something to keep in mind is that adolescents are not completely incapable of making decisions. In fact, like I said before, they have access to decision-making abilities. Um, and given support to control competing motivational cues, they are able to engage in adult decision-making. So this is my final slide, which I think is very important. Adolescence is not a disease. <laughs> Adolescence is a crucial and necessary part of development. It's a plastic moment that really allows the brain, in some ways for the last time, to really adapt itself to its environment. And to keep in mind that risk-taking might be an adaptive mechanism. Um, that allows the individual to go out, veer into the environment, away from parents, so they can gain the independent skills to make them into a successful adult. And I want to recognize my laboratory because I want you to know that it takes a village to do these types of things. Thank you.